Amen. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? My name is Abigail, like Pastor Dan just said, and if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, I would absolutely love to. Dan and I have the honor of leading this church. We planted this church uh, four and a half years ago, and we still feel like we're just getting started. God's done so many incredible things in the journey, and there are no ordinary Sundays for us. Like, we say that all the time in our dream team huddle on Sunday mornings. Like, there's never an ordinary Sunday because the Spirit of God is moving and He wants to speak something fresh into your life. There's always a new word and a new season and something that He wants to speak, and I'm believing that for us this morning. It's going to be a great morning together. We have been in a series called Jesus in His Own Words. Because here's the thing, sometimes we can know a lot about somebody, but until you get to know them up close and personal, um, is that's when you truly, truly know someone. And so we're looking at the seven I am statements from Jesus, uh, these seven statements where he talks about who he is, and it's giving us so much insight into who he is. We talked about how Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. And I'm excited to continue in our series this morning. Do you guys know that on Tuesday, it's the first day of spring? Like Tuesday is the first day of spring. I know. Praise God. Like we're always so ready. Um, when, do you guys hear, is, are my earrings making some background noise? I'm going to take these off. You guys, did you know there was some snow this morning? Like, I was setting up, I look out the window, and there's flurries. Like, there's flurries out there. But Tuesday's coming, there might be snow in the forecast, but um, many of us who are gardeners, who are thinking about kind of um, the spring, some of you have a green thumb in this church, praise God, uh, we're going to be looking at an I am statement that might speak to you today, and uh, it's going to speak to all of us, but as spring approaches, it's, it's a beautiful illustration that Jesus uses. Today, we're going to look, out, look at the text um, in John 15, where Jesus proclaims, I am the true vine. He says, I am the true vine. This is actually the last I am statement that Jesus gives. And as Jesus gets closer and closer to the cross, he spends more and more time with his disciples and he's pouring into them. He's speaking life over them. He's giving them insight into who he is. And so we see this beautiful imagery and I'm going to read the first eight verses of John 15. If you have your Bible, you can open it. Uh, maybe you can scroll there, and it will be on the screen behind me. John 15, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Honestly, I feel like we could just stop right there. Like the text is so good. It speaks volumes. Um, oh, this is one of my favorite texts in all of scripture. It's so insightful. It's so beautiful. Jesus is giving us this insight on how to stay connected to him and remain in him because he knows he's about to leave. And so he's speaking this word over his disciples through an illustration so powerful. I want to give a little context to kind of what's happening around this story. So here Jesus is talking to his disciples right after Passover. So they were just in the upper room together, and now they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus eventually will be arrested. And so most commentators interpret that in John 15 through 17, Jesus and the disciples are in between the upper room and the garden. 
So they're traveling and they're on their way and Jesus is having these conversations with his disciples and they're between these two places. So he'd be talking as he's walking along the pathway of the Mount of Olives um, and in the vineyard. So imagine this, I brought a picture of some grapes, some vineyards. There would be vineyards and olive groves all around. Like just picture it, they're walking, they're traveling, Jesus is talking and they can see with their eyes the illustration that Jesus is speaking with his mouth. And so the garden actually that they're headed towards is named Gethsemane, which means wine press. I thought that was so interesting. And of course, of course, context plays a role here because Jesus tells the disciples, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Jesus uses this gardening illustration, which would make sense to them because they're literally seeing the illustration played out in front of them. And so in our text, we see Jesus introduces himself as the true vine. If you're a note taker, write that down. Jesus is the true vine. He presents himself as the source of life that we're meant to be a branch connected to. And remaining in in Jesus is about really being tethered to him like he is your source of life, like he is your oxygen source. Jesus is saying he's not a supplement for your life, he is the source of your life. He says, I am the true vine. Do you guys notice how he doesn't just say, I am the vine or I am a vine? He says, I am the true vine, which to me uh, implies that there might be some false vines. And I just got thinking about that. Sometimes I think Jesus gets added to our life, like the constellation of our life, the areas in our life that we um, actually find life from, like maybe hobbies, families, friends, careers, even our spouse, our kids. And sometimes Jesus just gets added to that list. And those are not true vines. Those are not places where you will actually find a life source. He's saying, I am the true vine. I'm it. Like if you want to find true life that will be a source and supply for you, you will find it in me. And so Jesus is the true vine. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't be connected to those things. I'm saying the only source that is going to be long lasting and true, the place for you to find life that is abundant is in Jesus. And so as Jesus is giving this talk, particularly during the time of Passover, they're getting ready to go to the temple to make some sacrifices that they offer for their sins. And so in the city of Jerusalem, if you were there in the first century, there would be these gates that would welcome you as you enter into the temple. And there were massive gates, and on the gates, there was this carving of in gold, like 90 foot, huge carving of a vine. And so maybe you know this, but maybe you don't. In my study, this was so interesting. A vine was actually a meaningful representation to them already because the vine represented Israel and the Israelite people. It was a symbol of their nation and the prosperity that they found. And the vine really signified their understanding of their place in the world. And so before Jesus even shows himself as the true vine, all throughout the Old Testament, we see the vine pop up as a representation for Israel. And so even in Psalm 80, verse 8, it says, You brought the vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations, which is Israel, and planted it. And so the vine being Israel was taken out of Egypt, led to the promised land. Israel's abiding place was the promised land. Israel was a significant uh, representation and the vine signified Israel's place. And so when Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, I am the true vine, this would have been a revolutionary concept to them. Are you following me? Like this would have been a big deal because they are understanding that the Israelites themselves are the vine and Jesus is coming in and he's saying, I am the true vine. I am the place that you will find life. Like you don't 
have to any longer find your life source in your religious group or in the, the, the national representation that Israel is. He's saying it's not your identity anymore. Your identity is found in me. So their abiding place is no longer a place on the map. It's found in a person and his name is Jesus. Isn't that so powerful? Revolutionary, such a big deal for the disciples to be hearing that. They're saying, what? Like you are the true vine. The promised land is a person. And I just think it's so powerful. Once again, shows that Jesus came in as the new covenant, that the old covenant's gone and Jesus replaces it and he's the true vine. Such a big deal, such a beautiful representation. And so I hope that adds meaning to you as we study this, that Jesus saying I'm the true vine is multifaceted and rich in so many ways. And then he goes on to say, you are the branches. So he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you're taking notes, you can write down, we are the branches. In verse five, five, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. And such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And so we see the branch's job is to remain. Isn't it so repetitive in that text? Like, I feel like I just said remain like a hundred times. Uh, the, the word remain is used 11 times in the first 10 verses. John loves the word remain. Um, he uses it like 43 times in his gospel. Such a powerful word. I want to show you the Greek word. Um, it says mene is the Greek word for remain. It's to stay, to abide, to dwell, to remain, to endure, to last to persist, to continue to live, to wait for, to await. And I think right here uh, is really a key for us as Christians. I think Jesus is letting us in on like, this is how to do life with me is right here. You remain, you remain, you stay. Maybe your translation says abide. You abide, you're staying connected. You're connected to the true life source. This is how we're supposed to walk out our journey with Jesus because it's a place we live, a place that we dwell. Kind of like how when you like wear a sweatshirt and you don't take it off, like you remain in that cozy sweatshirt. Does anyone else have like a favorite sweatshirt that you remain in? Just You just live in it? Yes, Tyler, I see you. Me and Tyler are wearing... Like, I wore my favorite sweatshirt two days in a row. Like, it's confession. Like, Friday, Saturday. And I saw some people both days, and I was like, yeah, this is it's true. I'm just still remaining in my sweatshirt. You know how, like, when you far- charge, you charge your phone in the morning, and you hope that you will last on its battery life through the whole day? And like you plug it in, you charge it, maybe charge it overnight, and you're like hoping that it will make it to the end of the day. Well, remaining in Jesus is like having a portable charger with you wherever you go. It's like the life source is with you. Like he's, he's in you and he's around you. He says, remain in me and I'll remain in you. So he is surrounding you and he's inside of you. And he will give you the source that you need, the life power that you need to go about your day. I think some of us are accustomed to spiritually recharging and then living off that recharge for as long as it remains. Listen, that is not the life he's calling us to live. And there's no shame. Like some of us come, you, maybe you came this morning because you need a little recharge. Like you're feeling that battery is empty and you're like, God, I need a word. I need to worship. I need to get in your presence. And that's okay. But we're not supposed to just stay there. God has given you the ability and the invitation to remain in him seven days of the week that God will be with you and supply all your needs and keep you fired up and keep you filled up seven days of the week. You don't have to plug in and plug out. Jesus wants you to remain in him in the active present tense, which is the tense that this word is in, the active present. It's it's an active pursuit of remaining in him. How do we do this? I just want to encourage you, get connected to the life source. Read your Bible 
Like get to know the words of Jesus. Like really figure out who he is. Remain in the word and talk to Jesus. Talk to him like he's your best friend. Talk to him like he's really there with you because he is. Stay close to him. Remaining in Jesus is living in this present moment awareness of his presence. And it will change your perspective on him. It will change your identity, your thoughts in him, your coming, your going, like you're living in this place connected to Jesus. Being a branch to the true vine means living with Christ and doing just day-to-day life with him. Like, for instance, Dan and I are, like, able to sit in each other's presence and not say anything to each other, and it's not awkward. Like, you know how you get to that place in your relationship? Like, maybe you're dating, and there's, like, it's, like, a huge... Um, like, you know, it's a, like, you know, you're getting closer when you can like sit and not say anything. Like when you're dating or maybe engaged or maybe it took you a long time. Like maybe some of you still, it's like awkward, but listen, that's how we're supposed to be with Jesus where you get to just sit in his presence and it isn't awkward. Like, I think sometimes we feel like we have to keep the conversation going with Jesus. Like we have to like have things to say and say it right. And Jesus is inviting you to be in his presence and and just rest in him and just remain there. And you can just pick up where you left off. And he already knows your thoughts. And so you can just come to him, talk in shorthand. He already knows. You remain close to him. We don't have to carry the conversation. Just enjoy his presence. I think that abiding is this subtle defiance against independence. I, I think that it's pushing back against our need for independence, individualism. Like, I think it's saying, you know what? I am not going to do this on my own. I'm not living off of the recharge from Sunday. Like, I have access to Almighty God, and I need Him. I'm dependent. I need to remain. Like, I can't do this day without Him. And so I think as we abide, it's actually pushing back against that need to be independent, because that is ingrained in our culture. Independence is celebrated, and there's reasons for that. But in the, the body of Christ and in the relationship with Jesus, dependence on God is what we should celebrate. Like, if you're here this morning, and it, like, it took everything you could to get here, and you're like in tears and worship, and you're like, my dependence on God has never been greater. Like, I just celebrate that today. Like, that's a big deal because that's what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for people who will say, you know what? You're the person that I want. I'm not trying to be out here independent, having it all together. I'm not trying to live this Christian life in my own power. Like, I've already tried that, and it doesn't work. Like, it's already failed me. Jesus is the source of life, and I'm here. I'm here to just be dependent on Jesus. And he's saying, you know, I've got the power that you need. I am the source that you need. I have life and healing healing and hope for you. And so we, we in the church, we're going to celebrate dependence on God because he's the one that will supply all your needs. You can rest in him. It makes me think of Matthew 6, verse 25. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? It got me thinking, like, a branch doesn't worry about where the life source will come from or if there will be a life source. They just remain. Like, there's this quiet confidence there where a branch just knows, like, the vine has got it, and my job is to stay connected. And, and that's, that's true for us. There's this peace and lack of worry that will come in remaining. Our job is to stay connected. I would say do everything you can to stay connected to the life source. Do everything you can. Because 
as you stay connected, Jesus goes on to say, then you will bear fruit. His assumption is that as you're connected to him, fruit will come. And so in verse four of our text in John 15, remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And he's like, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I am you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you will do nothing. Um, I got these grapes. Do you see these up here? I've been hiding them. I hid them in the kitchen so well this morning, like this kitchen, because I was so worried my kids would eat them. <laughs> and then I forgot about them until like the middle of worship. I'm like, the grapes! So I went and grabbed the grapes because, listen, when these are in my house, they're gone really fast. So I had to hide them. I got them from the grocery store yesterday. And um, it got me thinking, like, this, this lovely little branch here has been disconnected from the vine, right? It's been cut off so that we can enjoy it. It's been disconnected from the life source. But it may, it may look alive to you right now because it looks delicious. I'm about ready to eat some of these. They look amazing. But it's been disconnected from the life source. And so we all know that these grapes have a shelf life. Like, they won't last forever. They need to be eaten soon. And it got me thinking, like, how do you have fruit when it's not connected to the life source? Because I have fruit that isn't connected to the root. And it got me thinking that that, that is true for, for some of us in the body of Christ, that we have fruit when we're not connected to the life source. How do you see fruit if you're not connected to the root? Well, I think sometimes we can coast in our relationship with God. Has anyone ever been water skiing? And um, you are water skiing behind a boat that has an engine and you're holding on to a rope. And as long as you're holding on to that rope and being pulled behind a boat, you're gliding across the water and you're moving. And there's this momentum as you're moving forward. And how many of, how many of you know that have water ski that when you let go of the rope, you do not immediately fall? You coast for a little while longer until the momentum stops, and then you eventually will sink. And so sometimes, if you're still balancing and gliding along, you're going to continue on the journey, and it's going to look like there's movement, and you're going to stay above water for a little while. It might seem like you're floating, but it's only a matter of time that the energy from the boat that caused you to glide will stop. And I just think we're not called to coast in our Christian life. Like we're not called to coast on the momentum of yesterday because we're not meant to be on cruise control as a church. Like some of you might be coasting in on the fruit of yesterday because that's what got you here. But listen, there's power for you today. Don't coast on the fruit of yesterday. I don't want you to live off yesterday's momentum or yesterday's power source, like there's a power source for you today. And we're supposed to remain today. And so sometimes it looks like there's fruit in our life because we're coasting on the fruit of yesterday. But God has fresh fruit for you today. How do you have fruit when you're not attached to the root? Well, you can coast. You can coast on the fruit of yesterday. Or maybe you can conserve. Maybe you've been conserving. Does anyone freeze grapes? Like it's the best kept secret. Yes, Anthony. All right. Uh, my son Judah, whenever I buy, this is part of why I had to hide them, because whenever we, we, we have three kids, whenever I buy fruit, uh, grapes specifically, our oldest son Judah will take a whole bowl full and put them in the freezer and save them for later, because he says it tastes like ice cream. <laughs> like, it's actually so good, so refreshing to eat frozen grapes, so delicious. And sometimes I think what happens is we've conserved fruit from yesterday that we're still living on today. We've saved it up from the past. Like maybe you're somebody who's been walking with Jesus for like 30 years or so, and you're like, I've already memorized the scripture. I know the word. I've heard the message. I've stored up a whole bunch of fruit from yesterday, and you're living off this, cons this conservatory of fruit. And here's the deal. It's not what you know about Jesus that will keep you connected to the vine. It's who you know. And so 
while it's good to have those, those things stored up, God's calling you to have fresh fruit for today. And so you might be conserving from yesterday, but listen, the fruit of yesterday will not sustain you for the battles of today and tomorrow. Like, can I just tell you, you need a fresh word. You need some fresh fruit. You need a fresh connection to God. You need the power of the living God in you. The day and the word of yesterday is beautiful, but it isn't for today. God has a word for you today, some fresh fruit for you today. And so maybe you've been conserving and maybe you've been living off of what you learned yesterday. But can I challenge you, church? God's got a fresh word for you today. He has fresh fruit for you to produce today. He has something for you today. You can can have full access to the life source. And maybe it's not conserving, but maybe sometimes I think we have fruit without being rooted because we're consumers. I think some of us have fruit that isn't our own because we're consuming. It's so easy to do, to consume fruit from other people around you. And listen, this is how most of us have come into the the Christian walk, come into relationship with Jesus, is that we've come in and we've seen fruit and and we've partaken of someone else's fruit. But there might be a point where it comes to in your spiritual journey where you need to start producing fruit on your own and not consuming everyone else's fruit. Like maybe for you, you've been walking with Jesus for a while and you've been in church for a couple of years, but you've never participated. You've never given, you've never sacrificed, you've never served. Um, You've partaken of the fruit and the seed of everyone else's sacrifice, but you've been consuming. I might be stepping on some of your toes, but can I challenge you to the believers in the room? It's time to stop consuming fruit. It's time to be a part of participating. It's time to start being a part of sharing the fruit that God wants to produce uniquely in you because no one else can do it for you. I think Jesus has a unique role in each and every one of our lives. And he says, he wants you to be a part. He wants you to be a bringer. He wants you to bring that unique thing that only you can bring. There's some unique fruit that we're missing out on. I think of our missionaries that we support in Indonesia. They always talk about this fruit that they have there called rambutan. It's like this unique, delicious fruit. I've never tried it. And there's so many fruits that We've never tried, and maybe I'm going too far with the fruit analogy. But listen, I just kind of feel like in the body of Christ, if you're not participating, we're missing out. Like we're all missing out because you're not meant to come here and consume fruit only. Like if you're a new believer, I'm not speaking to you, but for those in the room that you've been walking with Jesus for a long time and you're here consuming and that's beautiful, but it's time time to start bringing. It's time to start participating. You're called to be a participator, a contributor. And I think for all of us, every single person in this room, God wants you to bear much fruit in every single season of your life. Like when Jesus uses this illustration, he's assuming that as you're connected to him, he's going to produce so much fruit through you if you remain planted. And that's the call that God has in each and every one of us, that we're supposed to be bringers of fruit. I think God is building a vineyard for our good and for his glory. Because here's the thing about fruit. It's life-giving to us, it's life-giving to the body of Christ, and it's appealing to the unbeliever. Fruit is life-giving to you, it's life-giving to the people around you, and it's appealing to the unbeliever. You know, like that. there's a song that says they will know you're Christians by your love. I think they'll know you're Christians by your fruit. Like I think the fruit that you are producing in your life will demonstrate and, and be appealing to the unbeliever. They'll be attracted to the fruit that you have because it's different than the world. I, of course, we're thinking like the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that love, that joy, that peace, like that isn't found in anywhere else. Like we as believers get to demonstrate what that looks like and share it with the world around us. In verse 8 of our text in John 15, it says, This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I think it's a mark of a disciple. Like when you're bearing a lot of fruit, it just shows who you're connected to. And there's only one true source, and it's Jesus. And God wants you to be fruitful. Um, Farmers 
say that if you want to have quality fruit this year and next year, that you have to prune the branches. You have to cut back a lot of the branches, and they actually call this process stressing the vines. And so those who are harvesting in their vineyards have this process of pruning back and stressing their vines so that they will be more fruitful this year and next year. And that the stressed vines actually produce the highest quality grapes. An unpruned vine really has no good chance at bearing good fruit because it actually becomes weighed down in overproduction. When a vine's branches are pruned, it puts its energy towards the healthy branches that remain, and those branches produce higher quality fruit. And so I love this idea of pruning. I think God rewards growth with pruning. His heart for you is to be healthy and have high quality fruit. And so we see Jesus set up God the Father as the gardener. And that's the third point. If you're a note taker, God is the gardener. He says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. And so when we think of this idea of pruning, I think sometimes, like, I'll speak for myself. I personally, when I hear pruning, there's a little bit of a negative connotation there. Is that true for anyone else? Like pruning, you kind of think of like punishment. Like that's how I've always viewed it growing up and in my life, like messages that I've heard that like God prunes you and it's like this punishment um, because maybe you weren't like producing enough fruit or maybe you weren't healthy enough. And so, um, I don't know, I've, I've seen it through such a different lens as I've studied it. Um, you know that song that we don't sing here at Hope Culture Church? It's a worship song <laughs> um, that says, like, you give and take away. You give in, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Ooh, it just, it gets met, it gets complicated theologically. Like if we as believers view pruning as God taking something or punishing us, pretty soon what can happen, the, the, the line of thinking where we can go is that every, every time something negative happens in our life or something is taken from us, we attribute it to God. And that is poor theology because God is not taking everything from you and steal. I mean, we have the devil who wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. And sometimes I see Christians blaming God for something that he had nothing to do with. And so we need discernment here and wisdom. Like, hear my heart in the holistic view of God is that we need wisdom and discernment. Sometimes God might be pruning you, but also it might be the devil or it might be your sin and the poor decisions that you made that caused that relationship to suffer or that financial break, whatever it is. Like, we need discernment here. And so not all negative negative or, or uh, things being taken from you is necessarily God's pruning. And so every time like you go through something challenging, don't quickly blame God and say he's pruning you. No, have a lens and a filter through the, the holistic story of scripture um, and, and see how good he is, how faithful he is, and how you have an enemy of your soul and the brokenness of our world. And I, I think this is just something I get passionate about personally because I've just, yeah, I've just been on both sides and I, I'm, I'm viewing, I'm viewing it differently. And I want to look at this text um, of pruning, not as punishment, um, but as invitation. And so he talks about, um, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it can be even more fruitful. And then he, Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Do you notice he says you are already clean? I was like wondering what that meant, and so I went to the Greek, and the word for clean there is basically the same word as prune. So Jesus is saying you're already pruned. They're already pruned. How are they pruned? By the word he had spoken to them. The pruning wasn't with a hand, it was with a word. And Jesus is always talking to his disciples, especially in the last days leading up to the cross. Like the pruning here that we're seeing is an adjusting of their values with his word. He's adjusting their mindsets. 
He's making these small corrections with his words. For example, a few chapters, well, a few chapters earlier, in a, different, in a different gospel, Jesus sends his disciples out two by two to go minister. And they get breakthrough, and they come back to Jesus, and they're like talking about the breakthrough and the miracles, the fruit, right, that they had just seen of their ministry, deliverances, healing. They're excited. They cast out demons in his name. And then what happened? The disciples amongst themselves started to argue about who is the greatest among them. And so, listen, there's fruit that's growing. Like, they're the branches. They're producing fruit. There's fruit in their ministry. But Jesus sees, all of a sudden, this branch is growing to a place that isn't healthy. It's a place that won't bear fruit. They're arguing, who is the greatest among us? And how does Jesus respond? He responds with a word. And he says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He corrects them with a word. Because the branch was starting to grow to a place that wouldn't be healthy and would only produce leaves, no fruit. Jesus just points to what's developing in them that isn't healthy. He corrects them with a word. And this is why I think we need to know the word of God. Because it prunes us. It, it, it's a mirror for us. It reflects something in us. And it says, hey, that spot, like that, that mindset, that word, that theology, the way you viewed me isn't healthy. And so I'm going to correct that. I'm going to make an adjustment. I'm going to prune so that you can be healthier and so that we can get back to bearing some good, healthy fruit. And so there's fruit coming and it's beautiful, but he loves to come in and just correct our hearts and say, you know what? That, that's not of me. Like, you thought that because of this and that. That wasn't me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prune that back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to correct that. I'm going to speak a word over you and, and prune you and correct you. And he wants to sanctify us. I think that's why also we need the Holy Spirit to speak in real time. It says he's our counselor. And sometimes as, as we're speaking and as we're acting and as we're thinking, the Holy Spirit, the living Spirit of God will come in and just correct and course correct, speak a word. And by the way, Jesus, the ultimate example, he sets the example of of everything he just spoke to the disciples. He himself has been remaining in Jesus, producing fruit and being formed. I'm sorry, Jesus himself has been remaining in the Father and producing fruit and being corrected by him. And so it's beautiful how Jesus led the way in this. And now he says, do as I have done and remain in me. And I think pruning and fruit production is just a natural byproduct of remaining connected to the vine. Like God does the fruit production, God does the pruning. Our job is remaining. I think we often pray things like, God, make me into your image, like make me more like you. And in that, in doing that, like we we need to invite God to actually change us and prune us and, and speak a word over our lives. And so if you're a note taker, just write a couple of these questions down. This is for you to maybe process through. Like, is there evidence of fresh fruit in my life? Like, is there evidence of fresh fruit in my life? Not fruit from yesterday, not something I've conserved, not somebody else's fruit. Is God producing something in me? Will you invite the great gardener to be at work in your soul? Will you invite the gardener to come and prune you and speak a word over you? to correct your heart. And then I want to ask you, how's your connection? How's your connection to Jesus? Are you connected? Are you remaining? Are you a branch connected to the vine? Are you severed? How's your connection? I just think there's an invitation for every single one of us to remain. I think the, the power of God will flow, you, flow through you if you remain. And when we remain in Jesus, we're safe, we're taken care of, we're secure, we're full of the living God. We have a confidence and a calmness knowing, you know what, I'm connected to Jesus and that's my highest priority. I'm not going to worry as much about being connected to these other false vines. I'm going to say, Jesus, you're it for me. I want to be connected to you above every other thing in my life. Because fruit without Jesus has an expiration date. Like my children will be, this will be gone later, just a little bit. Like it has an, and then what happens? Once all of these beautiful grapes are gone, it will be a branch that will have nothing on it. And what, what, of what worth is it? It will have no nutrients. 
it, it will be thrown away because it's severed from the vine. The beautiful thing, if this was still connected, is that it would continue to produce grapes in every season. But it's been severed. And so we need to be branches that are connected, that are producing fruit. And so I'm, I just want to ask you, are you rooted or are you rotting? Like, are you connected? Are you remaining? Like, be real. Are you connected to the life source? Jesus is saying, remain in me today. And listen, as a church, like this is our heartbeat. We're not focused on the momentum or the word of yesterday. Like we believe God is a fresh word for us today. We're looking ahead to the future. We're on fire to share the hope of Jesus with our city. We're like, God wants to do a fresh thing in us today. That's why we gather together and get, get together to worship God and say, God, what do you want to speak to us today? Because we know this secret. We have access to a life source. We have access to the living God where he can speak a fresh word and bring some fresh fruit and say, I want to do a new thing. I want to bring healing in your life. I want to bring restoration to your marriage. I want to heal that mental illness. God, God wants to do a measurably more than we can ask, think, or imagine. And guess what? We, have believer, we as believers have access to the life source that, that, no one, that the world doesn't have. And so I just think this is one of the most powerful scriptures that we get to do this. And listen, there's a little bit of a fight here to stay connected. I think we have to fight to stay connected to the vine. We've got to pursue his presence. We have to pursue our daily bread. It's beautiful that we don't have to manufacture a life source. We don't have to maintain it. We just need to remain connected. And so I wonder what would happen if, like, we just took these words to heart today, like John 15, 1 through 8, 1 through 8 and 9, like, what if it wasn't like this three-year plan where we're like, all right, I'm going to figure out over the course of three years how to stay connected to Jesus. Like, sometimes I think we, we sit in these messages and we're like, yeah, I need to make some adjustments and it will take me this amount of time. We come up with a plan and some goals. I, I just feel like this is one of those messages that I hope that you are like feeling that pull to make some changes today. Like if you feel like you're severed in any way from this connection, that you feel that fire and push to get back connected to the life source today. Because listen, Jesus is coming back soon and we don't have any time to waste. Like we need to make sure our connection with Jesus is strong and stable. And so I'm just like, what if, what if we as a community were people who are all individually connected to the life source? We got everything that we needed from Jesus. I think our families would look different. I think our workplaces would look different, like our communities, our neighborhood, our city, because why? We would have fruit that would be appealing to the unbeliever, beneficial for us, and would bless the church and our community. Like we all need to have that individual connection with Jesus. I think we come in differently on Sundays. I think we come in because not on empty, like our battery is empty, but we'd come already filled up, because why? We've been with Jesus all week long. Like I've been remaining, I've been with him, I've been in his presence, I've been in my face, I've been in conversation with Jesus, I've been in the word. And so what if this wasn't a message that you're like, I'm gonna make a plan to figure out how to do that. I think some of us have constructed lives that are not conducive to following Jesus. I think some of us have schedules that don't allow for this lifestyle. I think some of you you need to make some adjustments and just reprioritize and say, you know what, this is going to be the most important thing. Like, I'm going to go home today, and I'm going to say, Jesus, you're it, and I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to get up earlier and meet with you because my passion and hunger for you is bigger and more than the, the pressures of this world. What if we made some adjustments, reprioritize? Maybe the lifestyle you're living isn't conducive to following Jesus. He's asking you to remain. And I want to close with, with verse 9. It says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. I love how Jesus kind of wraps up the analogy and goes to this verse, and he says, As the Father has loved you, so 
I have loved you. As the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Now remain in my love. It's just so beautiful. And it really comes down to that. Like he loved you so much that he said you can have full access to the power source. He loved each and every one of you so much that he gave you access. And I don't know if there's somebody in this room who maybe you have felt like you've never had access or you're, you're, you've, you're not a branch connected to the vine. And Jesus is inviting you because of his great love for you to become connected to the vine, to the true life source. Maybe you've been plugged into the wrong vine and it's just made you miserable. Maybe you've made choices and you've been getting life from places that you found out are disappointing and actually don't bring life. And maybe there's just someone in the room that is just feeling that nudge, like, I want to get connected to this true life source. And his name is Jesus. And you then will receive the abundant love of the Father as you remain in him. And so if anyone's in the room today and you're like, how do I do that? I want to invite you to make a decision today that will transform your life. Jesus died on the cross and bore the sins of the world, the sins that, that I committed and that you committed so that we can remain in Jesus and have life not only here on earth, but for eternity in heaven. And if you're in the room today and you've never been connected with Jesus, the invitation is that you confess your sins and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. And so you can make that decision today. And it will change your life. And I'm not saying it will all be easy, but you will live a life that's connected to something that's true and not false, something that is real and life-giving. And so if you're in the room today and you are like, I've never been connected to the vine. I want to plug into Jesus. I want to live a life for him. I want to experience the power source. If you're in the room and you're like, I want to make a decision to follow Jesus, would you just raise your hand? I know it's a brave thing to do in, in this room, but if you're in the room and you're like, I, I want to follow Jesus with my life, would you just raise your hand just so I can see it? I see your hand. Anyone else? All right, church, we're going to all pray together for the person that raised their hand. We're going to pray out loud because we all believe this together. So you pray out loud with me. Just say, Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. <laughs> Forgive me of my sins and make me a new creation. I love you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.